watching the press preview, first look at what's on the front pages. In the next half hour, see what's making the headlines with David Cameron's former chief of staff, Alex Dean, and the historian and author Kate Williams. Welcome, hello to both of you. Hello. Good to see you. Uh, front pages, though, first of all, Labour conference, not surprisingly, dominating many of the papers. Let's take you to the Independent, first of all. Corbyn Wu's Lost Generation is their top story. You can see a picture of uh, Mr Corbyn receiving applause after his speech. The Eye, sister paper headline, reads Corbyn gives up the centre ground. The Daily Telegraph reports that parts of Jeremy Corbyn's speech were written by a freelance speechwriter in the 1980s. The Times also reporting that the Labour leader's speech was overshadowed by the use of recycled text in his speech. While on the Metro front page, the reaction from the British grandmother who joined Islamic State shortly after the United Nations banned her from international travel. The Daily Mail says that a new law banning smoking while driving with children in the car won't be enforced by police. There's also a photograph of singer Cliff Richard who performed in Birmingham this evening, the second show of his 75th birthday tour. And finally, the Daily Star with the news from the US today that Jim Carrey's former girlfriend has reportedly committed suicide. Papers coming in all the time, in fact. Um, let's start, shall we, with the uh, independent front page, Corbyn Wu's A Lost Generation. Your assessment of the, uh, the speech today. Well, it's fascinating, isn't it, the difference between the, the paper's coverage? Because you look at the Telegraph and he says that Corbyn's struggling with his beleaguered leadership. You look at the Independent, he woos a lost generation, he's giving hope, he's inspiring. Completely different photos are chosen. And certainly it seems to me that the left-wing press are more in tune with the reception he got today and the reception he's getting across the country. Because even though as it has emerged today, some of those parts of the speech have been uh, written before, written in the 1980s, repeatedly rejected. The basic things he was saying, he said that 60,000, I think, people have joined since he became leader. He's, he's getting more people in. Talking of, and I think The Guardian news is, so, said about this earlier, which we haven't got yet, but The Guardian said he's it's just in, actually. a recognisable yep. language of the left. And I think mm. that is very true. It is a recognisable language of the left. It is talking about poverty. It's talking about austerity. It's talking about... Um, ideas that paternity and maternity pay and sick pay should be expended to, extended to many of those who are self-employed it's talking about one in seven workers one in seven workers it's talking about nationalization and it's talking about austerity and also he's tried to argue against some of his critics people who suggested he didn't want the armed forces he wasn't patriotic he said he do, do, does want the armed forces but not trident so he really did lay out his stall i think very clearly as to what he wanted well look i, I thought on the plus side he came across as genuine and sincere uh, on the negative, of course, this business about parts of the speech being borrowed elsewhere clearly don't help. And it doesn't help even in the papers that want to favour him. So on the front of The Guardian, don't accept what you're given, says Leader. I think that's one of the parts of uh, the speech that came from this text that uh, someone had submitted several times to different Labour leaders. It's strange echoes because you might remember Walter Mondale used material from Neil Kinnock's speeches back in, in the 70s. So it's, it's, these things have come full circle and the material's all most as old as, as the Mondale speech recycling um, from Kinnock. But for me, uh, you may be surprised to hear, I think he's been a bit hard done by on this. Look, I've written speeches for other people. I don't think, or parts of speeches, that they went on to, to merge with their own material and their own thinking and then deliver in their own style and way. And I don't think they were any less sincere in what they were saying because people had helped them uh, to do it. speech writer. Yeah, so I think we, it, it's foolish not to have um, assistance in doing a big conference speech. And I also think every famous figure in the, in the States, when they, they openly invite, in the course of making, let's say, a State of the Union address, um, submissions from Henry Kissinger, past, past presidents, grandees, and, yes, speechwriters. So I've got a bit of sympathy for Corbyn so, on that front. So you think that basically no politician can really criticise him because they all use speechwriters yeah. as well? Yeah, well, I, th th I think that... They can't criticise him about the way the speech came about. What you can criticise him for, I think, is fairly what was in it. So there was no mention of the deficit. Mm -hmm. And I think any Labour leader inheriting the mantle of leader of the Labour Party after Ed Miliband, who famously forgot his bit about the deficit in the economy in one of his set-piece speeches, should make the point that they do remember the economy is important and talk about that. And I thought the second thing it was weird not to have here from Corbyn, because he's seeking to reconnect with a part of the population that used to vote Labour and hasn't recently, 
is there was nothing in this speech about immigration or the European Union, issues that meant that millions of people who did vote Labour um, have moved in their position uh, towards other parties, most especially the UK. But there was, the wasn't there, there was a great deal of sympathy for those who are fleeing Syria, who become migrants, mm. no, so if on. they settle in Germany, get citizenship there, then they can move yeah, to the UK. Yeah, you, you, you I understand, understand you're making a difference there. In terms I'm, of I'm making in precisely the reverse point. That's a point about a foreign policy point that is relevant and many newspapers will like it, but hardly strikes to the concerns of millions Absolutely. of people in Britain. Absolutely, exactly. It's the reverse of the point that I'm making. Yes, precisely. Yeah. But I, th I, think, I think he was very wise because he was focusing on what makes him most popular and that's anti-austerity po policies and that's talking to people who feel that they're, yeah. they're, they're hard-working British families who are getting no reward, who are losing their tax credit who don't have sick pay if they're self-employed. I mean, we know that the self-employed increase every year. So I think he was really talking to his huge domestic but audiences. That, he knows that people vote on domestic issues. That's only credible. Well, hang on. If they know, you know they vote on domestic issues, then the Syria refugees point may maybe seem a little weird. But, but the point I was going to make was that um, if, you can, if you want to pursue that anti-austerity agenda, you have to display that you've got a sound grasp of economics and you know how you're going to run your economy in order to justify it. So you can't do one, I think, without the other. And he left out all of that part, even the... Miliband meant to say and didn't in his speech about the deficit. Uh, and I, he, I was he left that to, to his shadow chancellor, didn't he? And Andy Burnham tonight is talking about the migration right, question as the well. So issue he's leaving day. it to the specialists in the team to talk about those well, issues. It's you, the you, biggest issue of the day. It's got to be in your speech. But his argument would be that you know the, the traditional vision of Labour as overspending isn't correct. It's the Tories who've overspent even more and they haven't saved us any money. That was what he would well, say. And he'd say that if you bring people out of austerity, they can spend, they can become consumers, and they can kickstart the economy rather than being lost in poverty. Well, you, that you would be have given argument. a better speech than him. Yeah. But I do, I do think these pictures, by the way, are quite unfair. This you, is a complete you, you, difference you in picture, always get, isn't it? Um, you, the, people always look a bit funny if you take it from a different particular angle. And I just think, you know, you, there's a lot that you can criticise in Corbyn. You don't really need to snap him and pulling a funny... As we all, when we speak, have a different a picture in, in a moment of oddity. Me, definitely. You don't need to, to and, snap it. And the that. first paragraph in this article uh, in The Telegraph is, uh, is condemning to Jeremy Corbyn's first major speech as Labour leader was written in the 80s, rejected by every Labour leader since Neil Kinnock, yeah. undermining his claim to have ushered in a new policy. Because that's not actually true. It's, it is true that parts of this speech were written by somebody else, uh, an Mr. author Heller, called Heller. The sandwich, the kind of sandwich yeah. bits. Yeah, right, but it's, it's not the, it's not the the case that the whole speech was, was written. I mean, I'm not a fan of Corbyn and I'm not a fan of the speech, but I, I think there's enough to criticise without saying that. Well, Jeremy Corbyn has been speaking about that and, uh, and basically said this was all about the new politics. Let's listen. No, 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 no. This was a new, modern, totally up-to-date okay. speech. Oh, this yeah. is not... Um, this is a party going forward. This is a party winning people over. This is a party growing. We've got more members than ever before. Hardly fresh ideas, though, if this speech was written for Ed Miliband and he rejected it. Why are you it. so media so cynical? This was new ideas about a new way of doing politics, where we involve people, we treat people with respect. And that's different. So he's doing two things. The first is he's staying on message. You know, he's, he's ramming home the message that he wanted to make, no matter what the question was. But then when the question persisted with, he becomes aggressive. He goes on the front foot and accuses his questioner uh, of being in the wrong. You know, why are you so cynical? That can work for now. He's a new leader. And actually, like most politicians, going along with these things, um, we don't expect it. So there's a kind of new style to it. That's going to wear thin quite quickly, I think. But he certainly feels got out by the, the media, well, doesn't he? he? And, that, and that was definitely part of his message today in and that his, speech. And his speech when he became leader. But I think the problem is that when he became leader, it sounded very generous to say that Ed, Ed Miliband had been cruelly got at and that was unfair. It gets more difficult when you say, oh, I myself have been got at. I know mm. it's tough being a politician. I, I wouldn't want to do it. But I think the general public do get a bit weary of people complaining about the media and media yeah, intrusion. It's much more popular when you say, let, which, is, which is what he said, which I thought was very wise, saying, let's stop the... Um, internet bullying, let's stop the misogyny, let's stop saying mean things to each other, let's try and have grown-up politics. That's a much more popular message than, than getting at the media, which in the end, I do think the general public feel is a bit nitpicky. And he asked for the job. You know, he wanted to have this big, high-profile role, and it comes with more scrutiny and more criticism than other jobs. It just goes with the territory, doesn't it? And the question is what this does in the country. Traditional Labour, if we call it that, rather than old Labour, it's certainly a traditional Labour message. Will it hold sway? Will it answer some of those questions which the electorate rejected uh, back in May? 
Well, this is it. I mean, what it does seem to hold a lot of sway with are the young people. We know that a lot of young people have joined. A lot of young people are very excited by this. But we do have to remember that this is not a country with a youthful population. We have an ageing population. And to an extent, he does have to appeal to them. But certainly, I think it's very true to say that he's seizing a lot of voters yeah. from the Greens and from the SNP mm -hmm. and from the Liberal Democrats. So he's occupying this, this very traditional left-wing viewpoint. And I think, I think at the moment, it's, I think it's gaining a lot of supporters. Yeah. Early days. Was that the Times that you had? Because we hadn't seen yeah. it at the time. Oh. And, and just... that too, the Mirror. It's, it's new old Labour. They're trying to find a way of describing it as well, right. aren't they? If yeah, you just the mind Times. going back to the Times, the reason I, I want to go back was that it's actually different to how I understood it. It looks like Corbyn's aides initially claimed that the similarities were a coincidence, which it plainly isn't true, um, and then went on to say, oh, the speech was written by far cleverer people like Neil Coleman, who is, of course, um, Jeremy Corbyn's chief strategist. Mm. Well, the unfortunate thing for them is that Richard Heller had published his speech. He put it on his website. He, he's, he's so unlike the people who, you know, submit for State of the Union addresses who keep their uh, aid private, he said, well, forget it. Every Labour leader hasn't used this. It's time for me to make, make my genius public. Yeah. And then, bad luck, <laughs> a Labour leader yeah. actually uses it. Yeah, and I, then I, you can cross-reference <laughs> exactly yeah. which Google bits it. came from it. Yeah. I admire the persistence. I have to say, if I'd yeah. been a speech and got rejected in the 1980s, I don't think I'd keep trying. Yeah. But, you know, <laughs> it reminds us of all <laughs> of those who write and And he said to be delighted as well. He's, he's, he's off the board, isn't he? You know, Neil Kinnock <laughs> didn't take it, John Smith didn't take it, Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, Ed, Ed. Miliband. Hurrah! <laughs> <laughs> Bingo! Um, we... Let's talk more then with historian and author Kate Williams and uh, David Cameron's former chief of staff, PR consultant Alex Dean. Not surprising, we're going to start on Corbyn, all over the papers. Let's start at Britain as the way The Guardian chooses to report his speech today. Yes, let's start at Britain. I mean, it's a really positive uh, view of what Corbyn was talking about. We've seen a range across the papers, but pretty much you can see that the, the papers on the left are very supportive. The papers on the right are using words like beleaguered leadership. That's what we see in The Telegraph. But certainly, um, he's, he's talking about how it's bringing hope, how it's an exciting speech. He promised to stir up discontent across the country against injustice. And one uh, phrase that they used in another article in the paper, which they said that he was using a recognisable language to the left, a recognisable left language. And I think that's definitely what he's doing here. Some people might have uh, we might say that the reason why Labour lost the election, well, people will analyse it for years to come. One reason might be that they weren't quite so sure which ground they were occupying. This is very left. The left. It's talking about nationalisation, mm. mm. not renewing um, Trident. It's talking about um, protecting the self-employed. It's talking about tax credits. It's talking, also saying that uh, every school has to be answerable to local authority, which basically suggests that he means free schools have got free to out of the window. Out. So it's it, very, very clear left-wing policies that do appeal to a lot of people. So I think it was a pretty triumphant first speech. Triumphant, um, and uh, that's the way Jonathan Friedland chooses to say as well. For one hour, fans could forget about relegation. It's a wonderful take, isn't <laughs> sure. it, on, on, on this triumphalist. Um, we've won, but of course he's talking about his own leadership with this massive mandate he has. Oh, he has a massive mandate within his party, but the telling thing, I think, is that you've got to go beyond your party if you want to win an election. Mm. It's, uh, if his strategy, as it seems to me it may be here, is to solidify the base and to solidify his standing in the party first, and then seek to reach out uh, to the country, then that depends on the country still listening by the time you get to talk to your, your broader um, audience. Mm -hmm. And I, actually, I think this may have been his biggest opportunity, actually, to have a, a more inclusive and broader uh, mandate or message than he took. Because, of course, for every person that hears that message that Kate just set out and thinks, well, I don't approve of um, free schools or academies, mm -hmm. there's another person who says, well, little Johnny or Jeanette's doing rather well at their free school or academy and I'd rather they stay. But it's not about winning elections now at this point, is it? Well, I mean, I think I mean it the may... eye makes it quite clear that what you're talking about that he's given up the centre ground. This is so, about establishing who he is and what he believes in. Yes, it's not just about winning an election in four years' time, because we've got fixed term parliaments four and a half years' time. It's about reminding his MPs that he believes and that he's got a position that could win an election uh, 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 and therefore they shouldn't try to get rid of him. I mean, there's a, it's very telling, I think, that there's already speculation, not just in the right wing press either. I mean, talking about for an hour you could forget that people are thinking about relegation is quite a pointed uh, message, I think. Um, that Corbyn's leadership's already under some question. I actually think the eye has called this right, and it's by no means a right-leaning paper, of course, the eye, and it goes in a different direction to its sister paper, The Independent. Mm -hmm. Corbyn gives up centre ground, and that's precisely what I, and I think many people, probably in the moderate Labour Party, mm -hmm. would say he shouldn't do, that Labour wins when it cleaves to a moderate centre and 
pick, uh, stitches together a middle class policy set of policies which appeal to people who might otherwise vote conservative, doesn't lose its base, and appeals to enough people who might otherwise vote green or stay at home. Well, this is not Corbyn doing that. He's very particularly playing to a section of his audience. But he is, he is playing to this, and you talked about this earlier, Kate, that he's, he's wooing a lost generation. Uh, down the bottom, um, a think piece, mobilising the young voters will be vital but not enough. So who, who is he Well, wooing? he does appeal to young voters. He does appeal, as you say, to the Greens, the disaffected Liberal Democrats, and he's aiming, of course, at the SNP vote. Uh, but we do have to remember yeah. that we don't have a youthful population in this country. We, we have a, a, an ageing population. But I think what's, in, what's, what's key about what you were saying about giving up the centre ground is that that did work for Tony Blair. It may not be the same now in the changing country that we've had post the 2008 crash. We live in a very different world to the one we lived in the 1990s. So I think that actually, for, for many people, perhaps centre ground is that one saying that self-employed people should get, should get mm. sick leave and should get holidays mm. and should get some protection. And uh, you know, what he did, he abandons, there was no mention of things like mansion tax, which did cause a lot of controversy yeah, for the true. election. There was no mention of that. Well, there wasn't and any I, mention of the deficit either. That was a surprise There was a mention me. of inheritance tax, to be fair, it, there wasn't yeah. there? So I want to be, we shouldn't move on from the speech without talking about the criticism that's been offered mm. um, about borrowing or using parts mm. from a speechwriter. So there is a speechwriter called Heller, whose first name, Richard Heller, mm -hmm. um, who had submitted effectively unchanged, the same speech we are told, and I didn't know this before, uh, but submitted basically the same speech to every Labour leader since Neil Kinnock, saying, here is the speech you should give when you become leader. And none of them had used it until Jeremy Corbyn, who got it and chose to use a piece of it. So it is not the case, uh, um, contrary to the Telegraph's first paragraph, that his first major speech was written in the 1980s and uh, by somebody else. Mm. It was a, a part of it. And so, to my mind, whilst I think, as this conversation demonstrates, I think he got a lot wrong in the speech, I think that criticising people for using speech writers is, is ridiculous. I think that um, if you're going to make a major policy speech, you ought to have assistance and help, drawing on as broad a, a spectrum of talent as you can. And I don't think that the words that a leader uses in their speech becomes less genuine because they've had assistance or thought and talked with others in the course of preparing well, So you've written speeches for people, haven't yeah. you? If you got sent a speech as this was indeed sent to his speechwriter and to himself, would you have just borrowed it, do you think? I might have used it. I would have asked the, I would have taken a bit of due diligence. I might have asked the person, have you published this anywhere? Which, which this is, was published, It was published it? On, on the author's website, Blogsack. and that's why it got caught that it had been used before. I mean, when we talked about this before, but when oh. presidents write this their, um, State of the Union addresses uh, every year in the state, they have enormous numbers of submissions made by different departments, by um, very important persons, so Henry Kissinger will submit his part, secretaries of state, past secretaries of state, past presidents and so forth. The difference being, of course, they keep their material private. But if someone had a, a good clever nugget, a good line, then the answer is yes, I might yeah. use it. I, I might not use a great chunk of it, not changing word for word, but yes, I might. But I think the thing is, isn't it, that the, it, was, it was more like the sandwiches, the, the, the kind of wider perspective, but the actual things he was saying about, the, the specific things about Trident, about the armed forces, yeah. they were his own words. Yeah. But it, I mean, it, it was the bit, you don't have to stay poor. The, yes. Well, the trouble is, it was some of the most memorable bits. It was memorable yeah. bits. And yeah. The inspirational part the, yeah. to, to the hall. But it's amazing, because as a writer, you know, I do get rejected quite a lot. And as writers say to ourselves, that's that, ridiculous. As, as, <laughs> but as writers say to ourselves, if you're rejected, you must re-angle it for the next person. But he kept <laughs> this saying the same kept one the same over and over. And it worked. Yeah, it worked. Maybe we're going about it the wrong way. Yeah. 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 Uh, different, different pictures chosen, obviously, by the different newspapers. Mm. Corbyn makes his pitch for a modern left Britain. Row over recycled text overshadows debut conference speech. But was this modern left Labour we're seeing? Because even the the Mirror is struggling to work out what to call this. Yeah, from is it new politics. old? old Labour and what I mean, it looks now like the debate in a Corbyn led uh, Labour Party is between renationalising the railways and renationalising the railways without compensation. I mean, those are the that's the spectrum of, of discussion. Mm -hmm. The thing that he's got to do, and this is the other thing I thought was peculiar about the speech, he's got to draw back in those Labour moderates, for want of a better word, some might call them Blairites, um, who chose not to join his government, his, his shadow team, in any way. And chose not to stay for the speech, some of them. Yeah, I, well, I think, that's, I think that's petty. You know, he won fair and square and I would have stayed. But if he's going to reach out to those people, mm. then the policies that he plugged, I think, and indeed some of the name checks he shouted out, could have been um, tweaked towards demonstrating he was going to be a bit more inclusive. Not, it doesn't, I don't mean in the country, I mean specifically but, in his but parliamentary this, isn't party. Isn't this the point about Jeremy Corbyn? He doesn't have it within himself to deviate from what he believes. But I think, so he can't be... Which is in some ways, to his credit. Person. 
But, that, but, right. but it's interesting because he said, I like the fact of disagreement in the cabinet and I want to hear more of it. I want to hear your views. I mean, that's what he said when he was declared leader. Tell me your views on social media. I want to hear about them. And it was interesting to me in terms of the way he justified Trident. So we may see mm. that as a retrogressive policy of saying, well, that's an old policy. But he didn't say, uh, he didn't use anti-nuclear views. He actually used an economic uh, um, mm. Uh, argument saying it takes up a quarter of our defence spending on Trident, it's better spending this on the army. And so I think that actually that rational, that rational way of looking at Trident is going to make his attempt to not renew it, which many do not agree, including Maria Eagle, much more popular. And I think it probably will be a successful cornerstone. Yeah, but it's a very telling example, isn't it? Because it's the one that meant that he struggled, we, so we are told, but man widely <coughs> sourced, struggled to fill the defence role. Because there are plenty of people within the, the modern Labour Party who didn't believe, didn't agree with this policy. Mm, yeah. So I, I, I don't think, he, I'm not saying he shouldn't have said it, I'm just saying yeah. putting it in this prominence at this point may have been wrong. Just very quickly, unashamedly anti-austerity message, will that help win over those people who've turned to the SNP in Scotland? Because obviously Scotland going to the polls in May next year. I think it will, I think it will. I think Scotland is a place that has suffered from the, um, who feel they have suffered from the post-crash, from the, from, the, from the economic downturn and, and I think that's certainly what they feel that they've, and I think that it probably will help quite a lot and I think we can probably see some changes in the in the years to come and that will be a big a big triumph for Corbyn. I say yes, I say Corbyn will get some movement back in, in Scotland, of course Labour could hardly get any worse in some ways uh, but I think the big losers will be the Lib Dems again, the Lib Dems are going to get, remember the Lib All Dems still seats. got some representation, got they're gonna, um, they, if they hang on to one they'll be, I think it'll be quite lucky. Alex, my goodness. So, um, I think the Lib Dems get really squeezed again, Corbyn gains a bit, the SNP go down a bit but the SNP probably still win, right, so it, it's a very interesting dichotomy mm -hmm. In the country, where the SNP is exceptionally strong uh, in, in in Scotland, Labour have performed a bit better there, not enough to help them return to Westminster government, even if, if Scotland remains after a second vote if they get one. Uh, but the Lib Dems, the one unifying factor, the Lib Dems get swept uh, both north and south of the border. Okay, just very very quickly, one one quick story. It's still the economy, isn't it? Uh, the FT talking about the concern over China once again.